investor saying uh, investor saying private limited is a financial and digital literacy consulting firm um, I will talk a little bit more about the work that I do once I get into my presentation, uh, but suffice to say that it is an honor to be here. Uh, the topic we are speaking to is an, a topic that I am uh, very passionate about. Uh, it is also a topic that I believe is extremely important, especially for those of us who are running hubs, those of us who are running digital innovation hubs, and those who intend to start innovation hubs. Uh, so um, that is my preliminary introduction of self. And I think after the preliminaries have been done, I will uh, reintroduce myself within the context of the topic we are treating today. Uh, but let me thank uh, the colleagues who have invited me from the African EU. It is an honor to be here. It is a pleasure. And I look forward to an interesting session, uh, as well as to continuing to network with everyone who is here uh, into the foreseeable future. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, now uh, I give the floor to Konstantinos uh, to shortly present our project. Please. Yes, thank you, Sosa. Um, let me share my screen uh, so that you can see my presentation of the project. Okay, uh, can you see the slides rolling? Yes. Okay, uh, good morning for me. Uh, my name is Konstantinos Madrazikas. I work for Steaming for Social Change and uh, I'm responsible for uh, uh, all the impact assessment and evaluation procedures of the, of the project. So uh, please uh, uh, fill in the evaluation forms at the, at the end of, the, of this event. Uh, uh, African is you is a transcontinental uh, networking academy project and uh, it aims to uh, bring together European and African digital innovation hubs uh, in order to improve their capacity and uh, help them uh, get the, get them together to, in uh, collaboration to create uh, joint projects and exchange uh, knowledge. Uh, so that would be uh, knowledge and experience uh, sharing would be the first uh, objective of uh, this project. And uh, we also aim to create uh, some uh, partnerships that will be beneficial both for African and European hubs. And uh, also we believe that uh, the, through this process uh, we'll be able to have uh, people uh, create collective uh, projects uh, so that they will be able to boost the digital economy and empower people uh, in both uh, continents. Uh, so we have uh, 12 partners for uh, in Africa, uh, specifically Hapa Space in Ghana, Emerging Communities Africa in Nigeria, Buni Hub in Tanzania, and uh, Adbox in Uganda. And also we have uh, Innova in Porto Business School in Portugal, Tpixel in Italy, Youth Maker Hubs in Stimuli in Greece, uh, IDC in uh, Slovenia and ATBN uh, in the United Kingdom. The project comprises of uh, five phases. The first uh, phase uh, has, has been completed. Uh, and at that stage, we analyzed uh, the current conditions and uh, the needs uh, in the African uh, European digital innovation systems. And uh, uh, based on that, we have uh, went in phase two where we have developed uh, the activities for uh, the two main flagship uh, programs of the African EU Networking Academy. And uh, we, we then uh, moved to the rollout phase, which uh, we're, still, uh, we're still on that uh, stage where we, where we start to implement uh, the activities uh, that we have designed. Uh, phase four has started uh, in November when it was launched with a broker uh, event we had uh, in Bologna. And uh, phase five is a horizontal phase uh, and it aims to communicate and disseminate the outcomes of this project. And uh, since you're here, it seems that like uh, youth makers have the, are doing a really good job on that. Uh, so the networking academy is comprised of comprised of uh, two flagship uh, programs. The first one is at uh, capacity building, and the other one is uh, aimed at uh, partnership de uh, development. Uh, and 
as you can see in this uh, slide, it aims to bring together uh, different uh, people from different walks of life, from like policymakers, entrepreneurs, uh, startups, uh, and also engage uh, uh, African African networks and uh, diaspora, uh, and bring them all together in order to help uh, enhance the collaboration in the digital innovation sector. Uh, the capacity building uh, flagship program is uh, comprised by four thematics. Uh, the first one is business development uh, models and multi-actor approach. Uh, technology transfer and innovative technology is, is the second one. Uh, startups financial support uh, is the third uh, thematic, which is uh, this masterclass is part of. And uh, finally, we have uh, digital and entrepreneurial skills development. And the transcontinental uh, transcontinental partnership uh, development flagship program uh, also has uh, four uh, different thematics. Uh, it aims uh, at uh, creating a more connected uh, startup ecosystem and in uh, creating more employment uh, opportunities uh, for digitalization uh, and jobs, uh, attracting investment and creating opportunities for investment in the African market and also starting digital entrepreneurs and startups uh, in the African market. Uh, the program uh, is uh, underway since May 2022. As we can see, as you can see, we have uh, completed many of our uh, events. Uh, all these events are completed and uh, you can uh, find them in our YouTube channel and uh, our website. Uh, where you can find also some material we have developed uh, in this uh, process. And uh, right now we are concluding uh, February 2023. And uh, as you can see, we have uh, more events upcoming until uh, uh, October 2023, where we have the final capitalization event that will be uh, concluding uh, our project. All the academy events are free and uh, you can register in our website uh, so that you can uh, attend to more activities of African youth. Uh, and that will be all. Thank you very much for uh, your attention. Thank you, Konstantinos, uh, to present it. Uh, as you heard, it's a very interesting project with a lot of event already um, been and uh, a lot of them still to come. So if you missed anyone, you can also join later or you can uh, go and see them all in the YouTube channel. Uh, so, uh, and now uh, we are going to the most important part of this masterclass. So the slide the floor is yours, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. I want to thank you for this opportunity once again. I will go ahead and share my screen. And we can take it from there. All right. So I have been asked to speak mostly on uh, financing. And I, I like to play around with topics. So uh, don't worry whether the topic doesn't read exactly as you saw it as advertised. Um, and I've uh, titled it there. D is uh, short for digital hubs, uh, knowing that there might be a combination of people who are in this room, uh, those that are running in the main digital innovation hubs, uh, some that might be uh, running hubs. And I know that we are recording now, some who may listen to this are people who are running hubs that are not necessarily digital innovation hubs, uh, but perhaps are running hubs. This definitely is content that will uh, be able to be helpful to you. Um, I know that some who might join and some who might listen to this later on are SMEs or startups, uh, and you are interested in thinking about financing. Um, I went ahead and made the topic to be financing and sustainability models uh, for the simple reason that for most digital innovation hubs, for most hubs, when we speak about financing, we are pursuing something called sustainability. 
which I am going to go ahead and speak to. So uh, having introduced the topic, let me introduce myself. Uh, this is me as a facilitator. I normally like to put a picture of myself just in case uh, sometimes technology fails. Uh, at the very least, you can see who you are speaking to. My full name is Kudzai M. Mubaiwa. I am a Zimbabwean citizen, uh, but right now I am sitting in Nairobi in Kenya, in East Africa, and I am the co-founder or the founding uh, hub manager for Eyes on Hub Zimbabwe. And this is a hub that uh, takes care of makers, we also take care of uh, innovators, we take care uh, of uh, creatives, as well as small businesses and startups uh, within the Zimbabwean context. Uh, we've been around since 2015, uh, and I will speak a bit to my experiences in starting and co-founding that particular hub as I illustrate the topic today. I want to warn you in advance that I am a storyteller. Um, and so I enjoy uh, giving examples uh, because I believe that uh, there's room, yes, for uh, some theory, which I will share. Um, I have shared a slideshow, which I believe can be shared with you after this, absolutely no harm. Uh, but I also want to illustrate and bring to life some of my experiences in starting up about four different hubs. The fourth one is something that I'm working on uh, right now, uh, you know, within the context of uh, Kenya. So uh, I, the other work that I do is that I am uh, deep in consulting. Um, I've been the managing consultant of uh, Investor Saint Private Limited for the past 10 years. Uh, but I also am, and you'll see from my background, which I love to use now, uh, that I am the current board treasurer of AfriLabs. Uh, AfriLabs is uh, probably Africa's biggest network of uh, African innovation spaces. We are sitting now at 400 members in about 52 African countries. Uh, all of this will matter because everything I'm going to speak about in terms of experience experience is informed uh, by the experiences in my nation, experiences with Pan-African uh, situation. Uh, and in my own country, I've put in the former hub manager for Muzinda Hub. Uh, Muzinda is the first hub that I co-founded in 2013. This was Zimbabwe's first innovation hub, uh, and it was aligned to a corporate called Econet, which is the country's biggest, the country's biggest uh, telecoms uh, company. Uh, prior, I had uh, started up what was called uh, the Zimbabwe Youth Council National Entrepreneurship Development Program. Uh, which was also a hub that was serving youth entrepreneurs across the nation. Uh, so that is me, and uh, that is some of the work that I've done, uh, just to give you a little bit of insight into the work I've done and hopefully build trust uh, that perhaps I have some authority uh, to speak to this topic. Having said that, uh, a few more things about me. I have a banking background, so I started off my career as a banker. I studied banking and then later on uh, development finance uh, at the University of Stellenbosch Business School, which is in Cape Town. Uh, so I think I know a few things about numbers, fairly confident when it comes to that. Um, I also worked in stockbroking, in corporate finance, uh, in asset management and then shifted my career to what I do now, uh, which is economic development. So I normally like to joke that I got tired uh, of making money only for the rich people uh, and said, let me try and also make some impact uh, with uh, the economic development space, uh, which is more development work and seeks to uh, help people to make and to manage money. So it's still a space that I'm very actively involved in. Now to uh, draw down or to perhaps narrow down to the specific hub experience I have. Um, I've participated in uh, founding a hub that was aligned to the government. So the mandate was coming literally from uh, the government of my nation uh, to say we want to build a space for uh, supporting entrepreneurs and innovators across the nation. In my particular country, uh, we were divided, still are, into 10 provinces. And so this was a national program. Very, very important for us to understand this because the context will be very important. Uh, when we say national, then you take note that the mission, the mission is huge. Uh, the reach is quite huge. And you will find that some of you who are in here, uh, perhaps the format that your hub might take or your hub already has uh, is that you have already some support or some alignment uh, with something that a government is doing. Uh, governments are very important, especially for us in our African context. Uh, ideally, they should be uh, giving us a platform uh, or uh, building a society that is easy for us to do our work. Um, that would be in an ideal situation, not always the case, uh, but whichever the case, I will tell you that no one beats government when it comes to scale, to depth, and to reach. And so this is one first point I want to say to every hub as you build, particularly with the African context, uh, try to the extent that you can uh, to have uh, some understanding of what government is doing and perhaps uh, incline where you can in that direction or find a way of uh, connecting the work you are doing with some things 
that they already have in their own agendas. That makes it much, much smoother uh, in terms of doing the work that you're doing. I also have experience uh, working, like I've already said, with a corporate aligned hub, uh, Econet Wireless, which is where Muzinda Hub uh, started from is uh, arguably one of the Zimbabweans uh, biggest companies uh, in terms of telecoms it is the biggest company ever and it was uh, really responsible of them I think uh, to then say we want to start an innovation space so that we can support entrepreneurs uh, they are looking now at plus 10 million users uh, and the intention was to then say whoever can build some form of innovation uh, potentially could have access to that point uh, that number of subscribers uh, and uh, be able to scale and solve difficult and important problems uh, but last but not least I will speak to an experience that I had uh, which would out out call very loosely a civil uh, society in client hub and this is basically that type of hub uh, where you know you come together as friends or colleagues and say listen there's a specific problem we want to solve let's come together and uh, begin to uh, find how we can solve that difficult or important problem uh, and you are working with uh, different partners within the uh, civil society so having given you a background about me uh, let me say that i'm very confident to speak and to respond to any questions or queries at least with respect to my experience uh, working with government working with corporates working with civil society actors Let's now also uh, speak to the very last point about me. Uh, you can already tell from my background that I am very much aligned with the Pan-African organization, uh, but also some global experiences. I am a, a former board member, a supervisory board member of what is called the Global Innovation Gathering, uh, where it was a number of us from across the world. Uh, but I think the biggest numbers were European hub managers as well as African hub managers. Uh, so in a way, I, I really am uh, glad to see the work that you're doing now uh, because it speaks to uh, the very interesting connection that we have uh, intercontinentally and what we can learn from each other as we go. I want to now get into the objectives for this specific webinar. It is my intent uh, that by the time we are done, you would have at the very least uh, spoken uh, or perhaps uh, walk, in, walk away with uh, about four major objectives. The first one for me is uh, to emphasize what hub sustainability is and why it matters. Uh, I know this is probably a topic that uh, as other topics or masterclasses were being treated, uh, you must have gotten deep into, uh, but I want us to see the nexus between this and financing, uh, because generally when we speak to uh, financing, it is pointing to hub sustainability. And many times when we speak about a hub being sustainable, it will come back and speak to issues to do with financing. I want us also to appreciate the key challenges that emerge when we are seeking uh, sustainability. I also want us to identify the different uh, hub sustainability models. Uh, these are very, very important. And uh, what can work in an African context for me is very important. Uh, but also I believe that there are colleagues who are sitting in here uh, who are working largely in the EU context. Um, I, I like for us to then learn from each other. Uh, I was just uh, you know, uh, thumbing through and seeing that some of the past experiences that have been there have been perhaps a, a sharing from how some startups have worked, the experiences. I think that exchange is very, very important. And I was enjoying uh, the colleague who was just sharing uh, the intent for this particular program, uh, that that sharing is a very important aspect. Um, and so having said that, let me also speak to the very last um, objective for this webinar, which is that you may consider, and I think this is the best uh, takeaway that everyone who is in here must walk away with, whether you are a hub, a digital innovation hub, an SME owner, an entrepreneur, or you just hopped in here because you're curious, because this also works at a personal level. It is important to find the best economic model for you and to go ahead and implement it. Having said that, let me start by um, uh, defining what uh, sustainability is. And I want to uh, let you know that I'm going to treat the content today uh, with six units. And this is the very first one. Um, I will do the best I can to go through the content I have and then open up to see whether we receive any questions or comments uh, right at the very end. So when you speak about hub sustainability in general, we're talking about the ability of a hub of whatever nature to cover expenses, and this points to money, this points to financing, with predictable, reliable sources of funding. What does this mean if we break it down? This means that the hub must be able to generate income that, number one, contributes to its operational budget. Uh, any hub, any SME uh, is going to incur some kind of expenses. There is income, there is expenditure. It is those two things we talk about when we speak about a budget. 
We want to make sure that uh, when a hub is sustainable, it must be able to also generate income uh, that does not depend on a single source of external support. I'll say that this has been the vein uh, already. I can tell you for free that in all of the hubs that I've participated in building, uh, including the project I'm doing now, uh, many times it happens that a hub might start with only a single source of external and not internal support. Uh, and so when we speak of sustainability, we're saying that could be the start, no harm in that. But in the future, we want to make sure that such a hub is able to then uh, derive its own internal support from more than one source of financing or source of funding. And then of course, we want to make sure that that outside support that is received uh, is reliable or uh, in a best case, also replaceable. And so when we talk about hubs, and perhaps now let me narrow down more to the digital innovation hubs, uh, self-sustainability is best practice. Uh, for those of you that like to read, uh, there's what is or like to do formal courses. I know we're part of an academy here. If you want to do additional content, I personally benefited in the past from learning from uh, uh, the INBA. You can look up that particular institute, but I like their definition of sustainability, which I've borrowed here. Uh, so self-sustainability for any hub is best practice. And uh, while it is good to start somewhere, it is something that we must look at in the future and say, this is where we want to get to, a place where we are sustainable. And just like that, unit one is over. Can I invite that as I go, uh, because I am going to uh, pretty much plow through all the content first, uh, feel free to put into the chat any questions. And then what we'll do is that towards the end, um, we will look into the chat. That way you won't have uh, uh, the pressure to try and remember everything off the top of your heads. So unit one is done. May I congratulate every adult in here for completing one unit <laughs> of six on this uh, good afternoon or morning, depending on where you are in the world. Let's look at unit two now, which is some common challenges. I want us to know that when any hub seeks to be sustainable, there are some very common challenges. And let me, let me tell you this, that these are common in any part of the world. Now, uh, because I've ha had an opportunity to uh, build some hubs in a few different countries or support the work of hubs uh, in a number of African countries and also co-work some friends across the world who are building hubs of different types, I will tell you that the challenges uh, that we face are very common. Here are the common challenges. I've narrowed down to four. Uh, the first one is appreciating the value of hubs contribution. Now you go into any country, you will see that there is a whole lot of work that is being done with respect to working with entrepreneurs or with innovators. Uh, and because of this, it is very easy to be lost in the noise of the very many ESOs or entrepreneurship or entrepreneurship support organizations. And so uh, many times when hubs are pitching the work that they do, uh, it sounds like they're just another organization working with entrepreneurs and innovators. And so for that reason, uh, that is a common challenge faced by many hubs. Uh, the second thing is to think about the fact that hubs themselves are constantly evolving. Now, one of the things I've learned in the past 10 years, which I've spent in hub spaces, is that the first version you will see of a hub that is uh, started in year one will not look the same in uh, two or three day years down the line. Hubs are constantly evolving, finding themselves uh, and realizing that perhaps some initial programming uh, might not be what they will need to do in the future. Uh, perhaps the initial target market or the personas they were wanting to serve might change in the future. And so for this reason, it might not be that easy uh, to pin down uh, some financing uh, that is also changing with you. Look, if it was in the world of uh, romance and love, uh, your partner might love you. Uh, like that. <laughs> There's a whole song, I can love you like that, all right? And perhaps they have some mandate in life uh, to walk with you as you change and you evolve and you go through your different eras in life. But a hub by itself, in as much as it is a, an institution that is a somewhat perhaps even a legal person, uh, not many institutions might be willing uh, to walk with you as you continue to find yourself. And this is a challenge uh, that becomes very common in order for uh, hubs to become sustainable or to find financing that matches that constant evolution. And uh, speaking of this, this brings me to the third one. Uh, you'll find that another hub sustainability consideration uh, is around mission. And this really comes now to funding. Many times hubs might 
have a long-term mission. So by long-term here, I'm talking perhaps five plus years. You can see where you will be in a couple of years, half a decade from now, um, but you will find that the only available sources of funding might not really match the time zone or the time period you need to fully unpack the work that you are doing as a hub. Uh, oftentimes, uh, the kind of financing hubs we find is very short-term. And by short-term, it can be anything by, oh yes, we're financing for you doing uh, a couple of webinars uh, for the next six months, uh, or perhaps offering testing facilities uh, for the next year, or whatever it may be that you focus on. And so that mismatch is a really huge issue, and that gives rise uh, to issues on cash flow, which I'll speak to uh, somewhere towards the end. Um, and the very last one, which is a common challenge for hub sustainability, is the fragmented response of uh, players. So you'll find that in the space that we are in, uh, in the community of hubs, uh, and the broader uh, ecosystem around them, you may find that they support for some things and not other things. They support for the short term, but not the long term. Uh, they support for uh, specific uh, initiatives. It could be climate one year, it could be women another, it could be youth, uh, it could be green. Uh, and so you would not really be easily able uh, to find the financing you require when all of these challenges are occurring. Uh, perhaps it would be interesting to know from those that are in the room uh, who are running hubs, uh, how many of you might have experienced some of these challenges, perhaps by just a show of hand uh, or a thumbs up, so that we make this a little bit more interactive. Do you relate with any of these? I can see a Filipina there. Thank you. I can see, yes, I can see some thumbs up. Okay, great. Good to hear that I am not speaking to people who are uh, unaware or have not experienced these things. So here's a thought. Um, perhaps we should have defined what a hub is, but let me say that this particular uh, session is useful for anyone who is an entrepreneurship support organization, uh, what we normally call ESOs in Africa. Some of you are hubs, you don't know it. Some of you are innovation spaces, you don't know it. Uh, whatever the definition you call yourself, as long as you are working with and supporting entrepreneurs and innovators, and particularly so in the digital age, then you are definitely one of us. So congratulations, we are one third of the way in. Uh, you have treated two units. Let's yeah. speak now to the third unit. And I think this one, again, many of you will certainly relate. Again, uh, we have uh, taken time to try and find out what are the major money drainers in most hubs. Uh, you will find that most hubs, whether they are the old school type uh, or the emerging digital innovation hubs, will face these specific issues. The first five or the five biggest matters that will take out money, and this is also true for those of you that are running entrepreneurship um, initiatives uh, or entrepreneurship programs, however you define yourself, the first one is always rent. Uh, so look, one of the things we always talk about is do we have a roof of our head? Can we keep the lights on? And I was saying that if you've joined this meeting and you're an individual, uh, again, I think this is one of the biggest costs. I do a lot of financial literacy training. Uh, the biggest cost, whenever you ask people what their costs are, will always be, do I have a roof over my head? It is rent. It is keeping the lights on. That is the biggest drainer because you have to have a location. Uh, digital innovation hubs in some spaces can get away with it. But with an African context, in order to build trust, uh, frankly, you can't really start from just being on a, on a virtual program, as it were. Uh, many times people ask you, where are you located? <laughs> and this speaks to a physical space. And no matter how small, the cost of rent will always be a major money drainer for most hubs. The second one, not necessarily in its order, is the staff. And I want to say that people are important. People are important because for us to have a hub, for us to have programs, for us to uh, take people through the things we want them to take them through, there must be people who are doing it. There must be people in admin. There must be program officers. There must be directors. Uh, people are required. And people are not working on the basis of benevolence. Uh, they will also need to pay their bills. They will also need to relieve, receive a salary. Uh, even if you have a format that is lean and you're only giving perhaps allowances, uh, still, the cost of staff is a big money drainer. The third one is equipment. This is really big for those of you who are in here and perhaps you are offering testing facilities. 
uh, you know that you have to make an investment upfront uh, with absolutely zero knowledge of who will come in. It's like a webinar. We basically run this on the basis of faith. We have a speaker. I prepared content. I'm being hosted by the African African EU team, uh, but we would never really know who might walk in into this, into this webinar. So thank God that there's technology and we record. We know that some people might have access to this particular session afterwards. Not so with those of you that are already paying for equipment, you have computers, you have testing facilities, you have 3D machines. All of these things are already set up in a specific space without certainty that there will be users. And even if they are, there isn't certainty how many will come in and at what time. So even if you wanted to do a model where you are speaking to a partner who says, listen, I will pay uh, for those that will come in, it's very difficult, especially when you're starting up, uh, to estimate what kind of traffic you'll have. And so you'll find that a major money drainer for many hubs is ensuring that they have equipment. Very, very important, especially for digital innovation hubs, uh, whose core work is to really assist um, you know, entrepreneurs, innovators, uh, to build sound uh, enterprises uh, in a very digital world. Uh, the support that will be required there is not only the soft ones, uh, but it is also uh, very uh, physical things. Hardware is always a very, very big uh, cost. And uh, let's come to programs themselves. When we host people, uh, they will need to sit somewhere. So we need furniture. Uh, it's probably this could sit under equipment. It should probably furniture and equipment. Uh, but the soft things, you know, if we are bringing in trainers, they will need to be paid. If you are gathering people, they will need to be fed. They will make use of the facilities. Uh, so that is water, that is lights, that is heating, depending on where you are. And then, of course, last but not least, uh, we are in a digital age. The internet is a very big cost. And I think this is one of the problems that we are aware of in many African countries, uh, where we know that the cost of internet is very high. Wi-Fi very high. Most of our users are using uh, probably mobile internet uh, to tether. Uh, the cost of doing that is quite high. Uh, and so you will find that these then make up the major money drainers in most hubs. Rent, staff, equipment, programs, internet. If you're wanting to finance a hub, these are some things I want you to keep in mind that you must have. I can tell you something already for free, lest I forget. Uh, some of the ways of financing these particular costs might be finding already uh, you know, partners who are able to pick up this cost. So it's not always that when it comes to financing, what you need is actual cash. If you're able to find a partner that allows you a space to work from, then you treat one of the biggest money drainers. Uh, if you find a partner that is happy to uh, sponsor administration and operations, then you know that the staff cost is picked up. If you find a partner that is able to give you not cash, but are able to give you hardware uh, in the form of uh, different uh, facilities, uh, testing facilities. It could be computers or mobile devices or 3D machines. Uh, again, that shaves off or takes away the pressure of that money drainer. If you find partners that are willing to pay for specific programs, uh, albeit um, different ones, again, that leaves you in a really good place as a hub. And then, of course, last but not least, I think every digital innovation hub uh, should be friendly with internet providers in their respective countries, because these also uh, can help you with uh, financing uh, in non-cash uh, by offering you access to the internet. And I want to say that in all of the hubs I've worked with, um, I've been very privileged to ensure and uh, see that these particular types of partnerships uh, can actually take off. Uh, we've been in partnerships uh, where, uh, it's, and I know this is very easy for those of you that are working with government inclined ones, uh, government tends to join innovation programs uh, to things that are already existing, uh, like what we call a TVET. Uh, in my country, uh, they refer to, to those specific places that are found in every province uh, where they are teaching uh, technical skills. And so they may offer their already existing workspaces to say, you can run the program, but will avail you know, a place that you can work from. Uh, potentially, they may do the same for staff. You might need to train them. Uh, but again, that is a way. Um, I've worked in programs where we have had uh, you know, program partners that are willing uh, to offer equipment um, or pay for the programs themselves. I've also worked for programs uh, where, you know, uh, some of the country's leading telecoms providers have said, listen, we'll provide all of the internet that you need. And all of these money drainers, uh, that is the good news, can be treated by receiving support in non-cash items around these issues. So that is unit three. And I want to congratulate all of you for making it halfway in this presentation. Let's go now to the second half um, around issues to do with financing. I want to spend a little bit more time now uh, on unit four, which is the models that work. Now, having known that when we're speaking of funding or financing, 
digital innovation hubs. We want to be aware that there are many ways of, uh, and I'm sorry for the uh, cat owners, this is just a figurative English. Uh, there are many ways of skinning or killing a cat. <laughs> I don't intend to kill one uh, live here, uh, but let me say that there are many ways of treating uh, our issues. I will say that for most of us who are here, you will find that when you start your hub, you will start with what we call single promoter funding. This is funding by institutions which have a specific goal or a specific agenda uh, to push uh, at an innovation space or within the innovation hub. And promoters of this nature can really vary. Uh, I've put in just three examples because online we don't want to be here too long. Uh, adults can only be uh, you know, attentive for so long. But let me give you three examples um, that I know have worked in specific places. One could be a local government that is seeking to stimulate uh, community economic development. Uh, a lot of um, African countries now are waking up to the fact that when it comes to economic development, which is a broad, I'd say shared agenda in many African countries, um, economic development is very key. Uh, trying to do it at national level might be too big a bite, uh, but perhaps you may find that in a specific country, uh, in Zimbabwe, for example, a local councillor uh, could then say, uh, as a local government representative, I want to ensure that in my ward, uh, there is, I can stimulate community economic development. And they then begin to think about what do we have as a ward in terms of physical uh, uh, you know, uh, abilities? What are the people inclined towards? Uh, what is most of the economic activity towards? And then how do we support uh, the SMEs that are here or the entrepreneurs that are here uh, to go green, for example, or to go digital, if that is the agenda that they have? And so you may find that the local government um, might be the leading supporter and they make available, uh, you know, tranches of funds uh, to support, you know, uh, hubs that are already present within their local uh, government, uh, uh, you know, uh, boundaries, if I may call them that. Another exciting one are educational institutions, and this could be anyway. And what they will be doing is that they have an agenda to desire to promote student entrepreneurship and student innovation. You will find that in hubs, a lot of them are housed, um, you know, within uh, uh, local universities, uh, local technical colleges, which I think is a really great idea. And that model works because uh, already uh, they are being able to promote the innovation agenda, uh, but they already have a throughput. They have uh, a pipeline uh, through students uh, who perhaps could be final year students. I was speaking to some people last night um, at an innovation event where they were talking about how uh, they target final year students and bring to life their specific projects. And therefore they're able to already uh, uh, you know, get support because they're housed in one place. What you offer to them is the programming uh, and then of course access and linkages uh, that they might need to further the innovations or entrepreneurship initiatives that they are running. And so you would find that the single promoter there might be the university itself uh, so that they can be able to sell themselves as not just academic, uh, but promoting and uh, contributing to economic development within their space. Finally, this also happens, it could be a successful entrepreneur uh, who simply says, I think some of you are aware of uh, uh, things like the Jack Ma Foundation, for example, it's a successful entrepreneur who wants to afford other budding entrepreneurs a fair chance in establishing and commercializing their ideas. So I don't want you to feel guilty. Look, most hubs really start with single promoters uh, who are saying we have a specific agenda we want to treat and there might be a change as they go. Uh, second one I'll speak to is multiple promoter funding, uh, very similar to single promoter, but of course, this now is a number, it could be a consortium, uh, it could be several contributors to one space or one hub who are bound by the commitment to one shared overall goal. So classic promoters that you find under this description uh, can be civil society, uh, non-government actors, uh, corporates who are coming in consortium, uh, economic development institutions. These are just some examples. And uh, they can provide support in many different ways. They can provide grants. Uh, they can sponsor events. Uh, it can be in kind. I've already spoken to that. Property, furniture, devices, refurbishments, fittings. All of those things cost a lot of money. Uh, I remember starting up uh, one hub, which was uh, Muzinda Hub, which was the Econet one. We had to repurpose an entire house to make it a hub. And it cost a lot of money and we spent a lot of time on it. Uh, so if someone is willing to do that, please say yes. <laughs> it makes your life easier. Uh, so multiple promoter funding, uh, you know, they might also bring in internet services and they can also bring in uh, recommendations. Sometimes as a hub manager, you might run out of uh, people to speak. 
people to run masterclasses, uh, people to provide some trainings, but you'll find that if you have an ecosystem uh, of multiple uh, promoters, then within them, within that ecosystem, uh, there can always be linkages to the people you need and to the resources that you require. So that's the second model uh, that is very much tested, works very well. When you think of financing, don't always think of actual cash. Think about uh, the various uh, cash and non-cash items you might receive from different promoters. Let's now look into leasing space. I won't spend time on this uh, because I want to imagine that those of us who are building what I would call digital innovation hubs might not really be big on offering you know, a co-working space. But peradventure, some have hopped into this meeting uh, just so that we treat uh, your desires as well and your intents. Uh, I want to say that it actually does still work well in many places. Now, something that is very interesting uh, is that when we, you know, uh, got first into the pandemic, uh, when COVID became a big thing, I, be, I believe uh, into early 2020, three years ago, a lot of people had to go and work from home. And um, in as much as they would say, listen, I like it here, you, don't, you did realize that there was a lot of uh, disturbances. Uh, some of us were parents. It was in the form of our cute children. Um, I have a little daughter who was three then. For every single meeting I hopped on to, she wanted to say hi to my friends who are in the computer, all right? Uh, or it could be noise in your community, or it could be, uh, you know, uh, failing internet, uh, failing power, uh, or just not being able to concentrate. And so when we then, you know, move from the lockdown space, uh, a lot of people begin to think about, you know what, I can't really work home from home. I'm not very productive. Uh, let me find a co-working space. So as much as old hubs, you know, would be hosting only entrepreneurs and innovators, uh, we find that a lot of hubs now are hosting a lot of people who are, uh, you know, uh, 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 individuals who are uh, working for themselves, who are self-employed. Um, it is also people who are working as partners. It is small enterprises that cannot afford the rent we spoke to, but want to have a proper physical acceptable address. And so there's room now for those who are able to set up, uh, you know, a, a space, no matter how big, no matter how small, and you can divide it either into offices or hot desks or dedicated desks. But basically what happens is that these are shared facilities and people have access to workstations, uh, meeting spaces, and a number of services, including business addresses, which really matter in Africa. Now, there are some countries in Africa uh, where just even getting an address is an issue, uh, you know. Uh, and so you will find that it, it's not really a good look to have a, a non-formal address. Uh, and some hubs have made... Uh, some money by simply saying, listen, we might be two or three rooms, uh, but we are happy for other people to uh, have a virtual office with a physical location for dropping and picking up parcels here where we are. We offer a reception. Uh, and when people come in, they offer uh, there's opportunity to use the Internet, utilities, the telephone, a kitchen, copying machines and equipment like I spoke to before, uh, testing devices, 3D machines. Uh, spaces of this nature can also be let out for events to people who are not necessarily community members. Uh, so some of us do a lot of training. If I want to train five to 10 people, I don't really want to have a physical, uh, uh, you know, a, a fixed training space, uh, but I'm happy to uh, pay for one as and when I need it. But uh, let's come now to what a digital innovation hub would be. Uh, by its very nature, it's a support facility that helps companies to become more competitive by improving their business production uh, purpose, uh, processes as well as products and services by means of digital technology. I will tell you something that will happen in most African countries. They will start by walking in for these physical services first. And then it is then on you because you know you've got traffic from somewhere to then offer to say, listen, uh, you might be a solopreneur, you're working on your own. Uh, you might be a small uh, business, which is perhaps two or three people we could help you become more competitive. And so whatever services you offer as a digital innovation hub, uh, you can actually be able to build uh, throughput or to build uh, as it were a pipeline of users for your services who in the very first instance are attracted by the physical things you offer. Uh, and I can say this with great authority because I've been working on some research and on projects where you find that across Africa, a lot of hubs definitely have to have these physical spaces. People might start by gathering around a computer so that they can type, send emails, and learn a few digital skills. Eventually, they are building enterprises and they will require the services of a digital innovation hub. So in as much as you may start with the physical, many times you'll find that you then build uh, potential participants in your community as a digital 
Innovation Hub. Let me speak now to my um, the one I'm most passionate about uh, when I speak about uh, digital innovation hubs and hubs in terms of how they can finance themselves and uh, also become sustainable. I want you to know that as a hub, there are things that you know that a lot of people do not know. Because you've chosen to focus on a specific uh, group of personas, you've chosen to offer specific services, that experience has you uniquely positioned to understand and deal with particular groups of people. It could be youth, it could be women, it could be students, it could be innovators, it could be SMEs in a specific sector. And so you are probably best uh, uh, already uh, poised to deliver a particular type of services to them, uh, entrepreneurship training or particular technology training, uh, or even obtain information from these people under a research mandate. And this speaks to one of my favorite ways of financing a hub, which is consulting and research. Now, I'll tell you this, that the hubs that I've worked in, uh, all of them were sustainable because of different ways or hybrid ways of financing them. But my most favorite, the one that we started up with friends has been sustainable since inception because of consulting and research services. What we've noticed is that as a hub, we can actually be, uh, uh, you know, uh, we can be contracted uh, to offer specific trainings. We can be co uh, contracted uh, to build particular booklets or uh, materials for specific trainings, which are used uh, within, uh, you know, uh, big companies, corporates even. I'll tell you that something that we did when we uh, did a, a, a thumb, uh, you know, we, we do what we call and my brain is really frozen. I was thinking about the actual term we use for it. But we, we do a round of uh, surveys with our community, for example, in Afri Labs, and try to get a feel of, uh, of the 400 plus uh, type of institutions in there. Um, what services have you been able to offer to corporates, for example? One very popular one during the lockdowns uh, was the service of teaching people how to use Zoom or MS Teams. Because you see that for many of us, we're already doing this. Uh, and then for the rest of the world, uh, particularly so in Africa, they had to now play catch up. Uh, so you'd meet um, a very senior manager, uh, not very sure, how do I start a Zoom meeting? You know, how do I actually get people to get in there? How do I train my team? How do I run a team meeting? And very simple skill, very simple task, we had been doing this because we were hubs. Uh, we we're trying to reach people in different parts of the country from one location. And so we already had some special skills we were able to package and uh, be able to charge something for them. And so consulting will always remain something that I will encourage as many hubs as possible uh, to find uh, their niche. Um, and so you can find that as hubs, you can also support uh, to non-affiliated members, make some commission. You can host funded entrepreneurial training programs and you offer the content, the trainers, and then other people come in and label it uh, and also talk about the work that they want to do. You can participate in regional economic development work as advisors or as technical experts. You will realize that after having spent a lot of time working with innovators and entrepreneurs, you have a lot of experience. From one year plus, you actually have experience and you can always join hands with others. One of the things our hub has done is Izon uh, is to participate in a number of regional work, uh, you know, a number of cross-continental uh, projects similar to this one, because we understand our specific environment. We understand our region, which is SADAC. We understand the African innovation ecosystem because we've been in consortium in many uh, other uh, parts with a whole lot of other affiliates um, here. And I like that this program already is designed in such a way that you have more than one friend. Uh, so it's good that you share and partner. And perhaps in the future, you could even co-bid for some consulting work with some colleagues who are in this room. So let's come to the last one. I think uh, under models at work. Uh, innovation funds. One thing I'll tell you, innovators will always ask for, um, I'm currently working on a particular project where we have four pillars, and one of the pillars which I believe is uh, very common for a lot of EU uh, DIHs is to have uh, testing facilities, uh, you know, innovation ecosystem support, um, you know, access to finance, um, and I know access to finance will always be something that in our spaces people are consistently looking for. Now, I want us to understand that hubs, as hubs, we have a better understanding of startups, of entrepreneurs, of SMEs. And innovation funds uh, tend generally to fail um, when they are the old school type bankers, like I used to be in my old uh, life, um, who are asked to assess projects. They don't really have the eye to see uh, the best projects that could solve some difficult and important problems. But if a hub has opportunity to start up an innovation fund, 
And I would even dare say to say at whatever level or size, yes, you will find that you will be able uh, to uh, invest in a, a number of uh, high potential startups across all sectors in exchange perhaps for a little equity, which will make you money. Uh, most banking institutions are very rigid. Uh, many microfinance institutions uh, charge very high interest rates, so that's not really palatable to uh, SMEs or entrepreneurs. Uh, private equity players tend to find the typical incubator uh, graduate company if your innovation hub is running incubator program. Uh, they will have money that is, uh, very, is packaged in very big uh, parcels and might be too much for them, uh, and it will be too small for their minimum investment amounts. But the classic place that a small business an entrepreneur, an innovator who's starting out, still trying to find uh, a way of scaling, can be able to find money is through an innovation fund uh, that is built with sympathies towards them. And so a hub can actually be able to generate revenue itself uh, by equity investments into some of the entrepreneurs that have passed through its programs, or it can actually advance loans to businesses they thoroughly understand. When we started Eyes on Hub, uh, we did this with great success. Uh, sometimes it was just giving them order financing, um, sometimes it was uh, giving them a slightly a long term uh, in the sense of actually short term, perhaps a year up to three. Uh, and then, you know, as you as you grow and you get to know particular uh, entrepreneur enterprises, uh, you can also then link them to a more serious money, you know, to angel investors. Uh, perhaps they get ready now uh, to uh, receive investment from banks or the many other different types of financiers. I think we have like 10 or so different uh, ways we would uh, find to help them to uh, finance their enterprises. And so I want to say that in Africa, uh, don't look down on whatever amount of money. You might even start with 10,000 you know, euro or 10,000 United States dollars. That is serious money that can help an entrepreneur. And since examples I'm giving you are live uh, that have been in part of our former classes that is working on uh, some Ankara models and um, they make you know, uh, Ankara material, a lot like what I'm wearing here. Uh, and they then want to build an e-commerce website so that they can be able to sell to people who are in different places and then also deliver. And what they need is perhaps two or 3,000 uh, because they've got orders. They just need to buy some material, build a small platform. And once they fulfill those orders, they're able to pay back. So don't sleep on the small amounts that you might have. Don't sleep on the larger amounts as well uh, for those that are high potential startups uh, that might not be understood by bigger financial institutions, but you yourselves understand them. I think that's a really important uh, aspect that as uh, innovation hubs, we begin to think about uh, building innovation funds and funding you know, entrepreneurs and innovators whom we understand. Let's now go to unit five as I begin to draw towards a close. Unit five, is us thinking about the priorities that matter or finding our balance. It is important for every hub to know the key costs they have, depending on the type of mission you have, uh, the type of uh, you know, uh, personas you are treating, the type of programs you want to do, your costs will differ uh, per hub. It is important, I also believe point number two, to restructure yourselves to be lean. Now, uh, it's better that as a hub, and I'll speak to this very soon, you treat yourself as a startup. So in terms of manning, remember we said staff is a big cost. Start with very few people, right? Perhaps four, uh, someone who's in charge of programs, someone who's a team leader bringing everything together, someone in charge of finance, uh, you know, uh, someone in charge of perhaps business development. That could be a, a, I'll just say off the top of my head, uh, start as lean as you can, and then scale up progressively where there's actual demand. That way, you will make sure that you don't burn yourself out and you don't bend through whatever initial uh, support that you might have. Also, uh, consider what we call hybrids um, or program-specific funding, where you're saying we're going to treat uh, uh, women. For us, we were able to start with an initial incubation program. Uh, and then the year after, we realized that they want, there weren't as many women participating. Uh, so we started up a female founders program, and we had a lead for that and specific financing and partners for that, because there are institutions that will only fund things where there are women. So you take advantage of that. Uh, we realized that some telecoms companies wanted to do things with uh, youth. We built a program with them, which was specifically for uh, the youth. And that helps you to find your balance as you go. And you can leverage that which is available. Uh, generally, try not to say no to money, build the partnerships, get the logos. And the next partners, I'll tell you something which I learned first of all in banking. You know how bankers behave. Uh, someone once joked that bankers are those people that will offer you an umbrella, um, you know, when you don't need it, when it is raining. But when you go to them uh, before you actually have any money of your own and say, listen, 
uh, I think I might get rained on. Could I have money? They'll be like, mm -mm, we can't help you. But you buy your own umbrella when you want have it. Once you have an umbrella of your own, uh, they'll come back and say, oh, you want another umbrella? But you know, you can only use one umbrella at a time. Uh, and so what tends to happen within financing uh, is that people will generally uh, look for a place uh, to put money in that someone has already done due diligence. Uh, so here's the thing. I remember that one of our first funds we received as Eyes on Hub uh, was a very small tranche uh, from a bank called PUSB, a telecoms company called uh, Tel One, and EcoCash, which was the company's biggest mobile money uh, provider. What they gave us in total combined was just $2,000 for an event. But we asked them to put on their logos. We gave them an opportunity to also speak about their products. Uh, the bank was at the back opening bank accounts uh, for the entrepreneurs, and they became a, a program partner literally for the rest of our lives. They're still a partner up to now for some of the things that we do. But here's a thought. Other bigger brands, we're more confident to deal with us because we'll be able to point to say, look, we deal with EcoCash, we deal with Tel One, we deal with PUSB. And once we opened up, um, even into the civil society actor uh, space, first it was UNDP giving us a very small amount of money. Uh, and the moment other people saw UN, they're like, oh yes, then you guys must be onto something. Next it was UN Women, uh, the other family, group of families in, in the UN family, you know, the, the, the HIVOS or HIVOS of this world and many other development partners, the British Council, all of them would then come in because they were coming in with the confidence that you've worked with other solid partners before. So it's important to think about that hybrid or program specific funding uh, and uh, match that to the priorities that you yourselves would have. It is important as I draw towards a close, for every hub to find its own economic or business model. I will tell you that every hub is a different model. I took note that you were taken through business model canvas. Uh, let me reiterate and uh, uh, strengthen that which has gone before to say, even though you serve entrepreneurs and innovators yourselves uh, to find themselves and to uh, be able to build their enterprises and refine them in the digital world, it is important that you treat yourselves as a startup. You also want to make sure that you find your balance. Be like that uh, elephant I'm sharing there. On a very small bowl, but somehow able to distribute its weight and still remain balanced. I want to say that the biggest thing for any hub to find out is what product or service do we offer? As a digital innovation hub, as a hub, as an entrepreneur, what product or service do you offer? Because that is where you make the real money. So grants are okay for certain things. They're all the operations. But if you do not have a recurring product or service that you yourselves offer, then your economic model is very likely going to fail. And so I want to bring back the business model canvas. And uh, this is the particular image I like to use. I use this when I'm teaching children because it is very simple. It is important for every hub to know its value proposition, how you help. It is important to know your customer segments, the personas who you help. It is important to know your distribution channels. How will they find you? How will they know you? How will you deliver? All of these things seem very simple, boring, mundane. But if you're able to sit down with your hub team, your digital innovation hub team, it could be three of you or four, and create a first draft for your hub and review it as you go, treating yourselves as a hub, as a, as a startup, you will find a solid economic model for you. Now, everything I've given you so far in this class will help you to find your balance. Go and answer each of those questions and write them down. Uh, perhaps put it on a big board or in a big piece of paper and have that interaction within your hub. It will really help. SME owners who are here, I always say at least twice a year at the beginning of the year in January, uh, perhaps, or somewhere in uh, June, somewhere middle, always sit down as a team and talk through this business model canvas uh, for yourselves as a hub, for yourself as an SME, as a digital innovation hub. And then that will help you to now treat the things that are at the bottom. Costs, what are the costs that we will need to incur in order to deliver our value proposition? And then revenue, how can we make some kind of money from either the community we have, one of the things that people sleep on, and I was having a conversation on this yesterday, is data. Over time, as you begin to uh, treat and to uh, provide services to different people, uh, different personas, you'll find that you'll have a lot of data. Uh, granted, all of us will have to stick to uh, data protection laws. So it could be GDPR in the case of Europe. Uh, for us in Africa, many of us have data protection laws uh, specific to our countries. 
how we deal with that data is important, but we'll find that one of the things we learned uh, very early from the Afrilabs community is that uh, if we're able to have consistent data about our particular community, there's a way to also monetize that and pass on the benefits to our own community. Perhaps that data conversation is another thing for another day. Uh, hopefully that is part of this program. You'll get a chance to also talk through that. Uh, so I want to say, uh, as I come to the last bit, which is unit six, that numbers uh, do not lie. The topic which we were mandated to speak on was financing uh, for digital innovation hubs. Ultimately, similar to those whom we program for, who we want to make sure are sustainable or are making a profit, we also should be sustainable. It comes down to the numbers. There are many measures of sustainability. The biggest one is money. The biggest one is numbers. And so income and expenses are things we must be familiar with. Now, I'll tell you that perhaps this could be a topic as a follow-up topic for another day uh, by another facilitator, potentially, or by me, where you begin to deep dive into just these three things. Knowing how to do an income and expenditure uh, exercise. As you can tell from my uh, image there, many times income might come from one or two sources, but expenses are many. <laughs> In fact, we always joke that adulting is really graduating to paying as many bills as possible. And so you want to make sure that as a hub, you are very cognizant of what are the many ways you can make income. This would start from your business model canvas and uh, beginning to think about the various ways. Some of them have already mooted, uh, you know, some that are single source, some that are multiple source, some services, some products that you are offering. All of those should contribute towards your income. And then think about your expenses. There will be a number of them which are fixed, like the five that I told you, which are money drainers, and then a number of other small costs that will add up. In a perfect world, we want you to have a surplus of income over expenditure. Now, this could be a class, but also with the opportunity of the internet, there are quite a number of resources you can find, uh, quite a number of templates you can find that just help you to capture and make a simple budget. What is coming in and what is going out? And what are we looking for in a budget? We are simply looking to find our balance. We want to make sure that we are in a situation where in a perfect world, we have an excess of income over expenditure, or at the very minimum, we have a balance of income and expenses. Very important that we be familiar with income and expenditure. Second thing you want to be familiar, and this is very important, is cash flow. Now, this is one of the things I found that even as an association ourselves from Afrolabs or in all of the hubs that I've been a part of, you see, sometimes you might have money incoming. You have many partners. They are willing to help you with a number of things you are doing, programming, events, uh, even your operations. But perhaps the timing of the money becomes an issue where you will know that, look, given a five-year period, and we think we have a $100,000 budget, just as an example, maybe let me say in a year, um, and you have $100,000, uh, by the end of the year, you will have collected the $100,000. The only problem is it's coming in dribs and drabs. $2,000 comes in January, $4,000 comes in February, you know, $20,000 comes in November when civil society uh, uh, folks are trying to uh, spend as much as possible, you know, and then you have that mismatch. So, Mastering cash flow is an extremely important exercise. Um, start with income and expenditure, which is very simple. Income and expenses. This is basically you listing your income sources, listing the expenses, and then if there isn't a, if there's a mismatch, you can in theory be able to balance out by reducing some expenses, potentially increasing income. You find your balance. Finding balance with cash flow now is much more treacherous because there's really nothing you can do if a partner is saying, listen, we're not ready yet to release the funds. Or we will release the funds. Go ahead. And two weeks before the program, they put the rug on you and say, listen, our funder also didn't come through. Uh, do it. We will refund you or reimburse what you've used. And so this is one of the challenges. Uh, that is a very big challenge for a many uh, digital innovation hubs, uh, which is cash flow. A, a number of ideas around treating this uh, involve uh, already beginning to know what your cycle is and then making sure that you ensure that the money comes in first, then you begin to do the programming uh, such that by the time the next tranches come, uh, you already have uh, some, something stored that can take you on. It is also important uh, per, per, per adventure to offer particular services and goods that you know will ensure that you always have something that at the very least covers operational expenses. So something to think about. Many ideas that can be uh, shared around around cash flow. But let me warn you in advance that as you grow and you go, 
this will definitely be an issue and it is a shared problem across digital innovation hubs. The last thing, and I want to really encourage this, is balance sheets. A balance sheet is basically a place where you are showing what you own and what you owe. And ideally, we want you uh, to have uh, you know, assets, uh, things that are in your name. This is useful because some hubs have found it useful to actually find short-term financing from banks, uh, but they will need some form of security. So it does help, you know, to have something on your balance sheet. Uh, it could be a particular uh, property uh, or particular uh, assets uh, that have value uh, that can enable them to help you where you need it uh, with some short-term uh, cash as it were. But it is important that also in the, in the new world, you will find that assets are not just physical things, they're intangible things. Think about intellectual property. Again, a masterclass I'm hoping many of you will have. Uh, you will find that over time, uh, there are particular products, there are particular classes, uh, there are particular handbooks you generate. All of that can be monetized. All of that can become assets that have value that can appear somewhere in IP in your balance sheet. Let's not sleep on the amount of content we know, we generate, we push out. Let's make sure that we derive value from it. So I want to say three minutes before my target time. Uh, we've made it to the end and I want to thank you for your attention thus far. I will leave uh, this slide on for a bit so that you can capture my email and my uh, communications, but I believe that a copy of this will be circulated as well and you can reach out to the uh, uh, African EU team uh, for my details should you require them. I want to stop sharing now and uh, just check in the uh, the chat, if there might be any questions, any comments, anyone who wants to fight. Uh, thank you. Any. I am now putting into the chat uh, just my LinkedIn for those that may want to connect. Uh, let's continue the conversation. And yes, here is to your happy financing. Uh, after all has been said and done, um, I want to say that uh, numbers do not lie and ensure that you are finding your balance. Thank you very much to the team and the crew behind the scenes. I will stop here and I will yield uh, the mic uh, for you to take us on. Thank you. Thank you, Kutza, for this um, knowledge transfer. I think we all need it. Uh, if uh, someone uh, didn't hear any new information, but it was good that you remind us of the importance of being, being balanced and about sustainability. Uh, we are coming from the food sector and in the food sector, we always talk about sustainability. So it's uh, really interesting for me that also in financing world, the, uh, the word sustainability is also emerging. Uh, so if you have any uh, question, you can put it in the chat or ask uh, the speaker now. Otherwise, I will just put the link to the um, to the survey, or uh, better to say, to our evaluation forms, uh, that you can respond to it. Also, uh, if you uh, put your contact details in it, we can then uh, share with you your um, confirmation of attendance. Uh, here is. In the chat, just please bear with me. And here is the link. And I will also uh, send the link to evaluation form to our speaker. It's important that um, we know what we can do better in the next round. As you can uh, see from the um, presentation of Costantinos that we have a huge amount of events. Um, and we have a question uh, from Guido. How does a uh, hub determine the best internally generated funding sources? So my uh, short response is vibes, <laughs> but a more serious response uh, is to say that uh, most times when you're on the way, 
you can only uh, then find after some time, uh, let me say at least a full year after a hub is run for a year, it's then easier to find the things that you are good at. Uh, so hubs have different strengths. Some may be embedded in your staff. You might have really good training. Uh, so you have uh, soft skills in the sense of your people themselves and asset. Uh, and you can then be able to uh, be commissioned to do trainings for other people. Uh, it could be that you are good at content creation. Uh, again, that is a really good way of internally generating uh, funding uh, uh, sources. So you have uh, material that you have tried in a specific sector, in a specific place. Uh, so you 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 were just talking here um, about uh, how food is a, or the food space uh, is an important uh, place for you. You might have a training for uh, how to get started in the food business in, say, Zambia, right? And you generate a little booklet around that. You would find that the moment you actually are serious about generating and uh, perhaps recording, collecting content that you have, uh, that is something that you can be able to monetize and you not only offer the content itself, uh, but you also offer to deliver it in different places uh, to different people who might have a similar environment. Uh, so I want to say that it's really a lot of uh, testing and trying things as you go. Uh, some hubs, the more mature ones, particularly in Africa, you find that the initial ones, your bongo hives, your eye hubs, uh, make a lot of their money from consulting. Uh, because remember, 10 years of serving entrepreneurs, that's thousands of entrepreneurs served. They have a lot of data um, that they can also be monetized. Uh, they have a lot of uh, uh, internal capacity for research. Uh, they've made a lot of connections. Uh, they have a lot of uh, knowledge that have shared, they have learned that they can package and deliver. Uh, so I would say that the more you stick around or stay as a hub, uh, the more you are likely to find what you are doing. But I'm also very big on, um, on sharing, which I like is that one of the key components of this program, uh, where I would I highly encourage, uh, one of the things that I found very useful in my time uh, in the past 10 years is always to attend places where there are communities such as this. I know you have a very strong and vibrant uh, LinkedIn community, for example. Ask questions, ask other hubs, what are you doing to monetize? Um, and you find a way of replicating uh, that particular format in your specific area. Um, and I also see there's a follow-up there. Uh, if I may pick it up, what's your view on a hub becoming solely uh, donor dependent? If you go back uh, to our initial definition of what a hub uh, sustainability means, um, being solely dependent on one is definitely going to be uh, an unfair ask, uh, number one, on yourselves. Um, but number two, I think it's also a burden, and I don't have a better English word for this, on the one uh, initial uh, funder. I think we must applaud initial funders or supporters, uh, even though they're donors, uh, because they help us get off the ground and find ourselves. It's like receiving a scholarship of sorts. If it was an individual, if someone sends you to school, listen, it's you who chooses the program you want to do. It's up to you whether you do excellently in the, in the, in the programs that you are studying, getting A's. Uh, if someone takes you to primary and high school and you do very well, you can literally be on your own feet and independent from university because you can get a scholarship uh, you know, on the basis of your excellence. But you see, you can only get out of your specific circumstance because someone has given you a leg up. And so I think what is important, what is very important is to ensure that there is mutual benefit. So every donor definitely is seeking, uh, they have a particular agenda, they have an outcome they are pursuing. Uh, you also come in with an agenda. That is very important so that it's a, it's, a, it's a meeting of equals, as it were. You are implementing in a certain space. They also want to ensure that a certain agenda is, uh, is achieved. And so my view, Gideon, uh, is that you can be partners. You should always have the, uh, the thinking that you are partners. Uh, you are implementing. You are bringing the people. You are doing the programming. Uh, you have access. And be, believe me, you might not have all of the money that you require, uh, but you do have special skills that you can leverage. If you... If, so if a donor is coming into Zimbabwe, I have much more knowledge than they do. I know how to navigate my government. I know how to navigate everything. If I want to register people, I know everything that needs to be done. And so if they're coming in with other uh, resources like money, uh, or it might be even physical ones, uh, or equipment, uh, you know, we can then say, what is our shared agenda? This is your agenda. This is mine. But what do we have in common? And so we, we are working as equals, and we are working as partners. So that is my view. In the, in the long run, 
we are then looking to you uh, being you know, uh, sustainable would mean you would not only have that one partner for the entirety of your life. I think a good project, it gives less pressure on the other partner, bring in other partners as well, and then you can uh, work together in consortium as you go. Okay, any more questions? Gideon, no, just say thanks. Thank you. Hopefully you, you proceed with evaluation forms. And now uh, it's time for our group photo. So I will uh, ask you all of you to uh, put the camera on and put a smile on your face. <laughs> Okay, and then I will make the photo. Okay, we are good. So we have more, more comments. It was on Patrick Onomo, what will the AOCOM project will be able to achieve? Hopefully we will achieve a lot of knowledge transfer and capacity building and also networking and um, especially now that we are in the last phase of the project and we have these boot camps, hopefully we will have a lot of networking also in on the ground in Africa. Because uh, the brokerage event that we have in November was in uh, Europe, so we will all come to the uh, Africa now and proceed with uh, the net networking that already started in uh, Europe. So. I think that this is a, also the opportunity for collaborating after the project will end and also for starting uh, new new projects and new opportunities. So saying uh, short. And also Kiko says that thank you very much. It was truly useful. I couldn't agree more. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, we will have the uh, recording available on the YouTube. So if no other questions emerge, I would uh, really like to thank uh, Kudzai once again uh, to provide us with her speak. And thank you and see you again in the next uh, event or any other opportunity. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.